We're doing a journey this weekend from table to table. Journey from table to table. The, the journey began Friday as we took a look at the Passover table and all the elements that the Israelites were called to, to participate, commemorate, and then celebrate what God was doing. And that was, at that time, as they were slaves in Egypt, God had promised that he was going to pass through Egypt and he was going to destroy the firstborn. And for them to be rescued, for them to, to be saved and then set free from slavery so that they could go and be in the presence of God, they had to kill a lamb. They had to sacrifice a lamb, take the, some of the blood of that lamb, put it over the door frames of their households so that when the angel of death, the destroyer, came, he wouldn't pass through their household, but he would pass over. And they were protected by God's mercy. Blood atonement means to cover over. And so they were covered over in God's mercy so that judgment passed over their lives. Judgment and death. So we traveled from that table of which we talked about all the various elements and what they, what they meant and what they signified in terms of their relationship. And now we're going to travel to a new table. A table that I'm going to call the Father's Table. The Father's Table actually comes out of probably the most famous or the most well-known of all of the parables that Jesus talked about. See, a parable takes an earthly reality. So you take a dinner table and where family and friends come around it, that's an earthly reality that every person in the crowd would get and understand. But then it teaches a heavenly meaning. So the parable which many people know of as the parable of the prodigal son, which is actually really not appropriately named. It's not about the prodigal. It's about the loving father. It's about the loving father who had not one, but two lost sons. And the father wants nothing more than for his sons to enjoy not only his provision, but his presence. Not what he can just give them, but that, that he wants them to enjoy his company. And that is what God is calling each one of us today. As we come to this table, he's saying, I got a seat for you. I got a seat for you at my table. And it, is, it would be my greatest honor and my deepest desire that you'd pull up a chair and enjoy not only my provision, but my presence with you. Because I so enjoy your presence. So, as we take a look at this, I want to just pause quickly because when Jesus, if you're if you're not really familiar, Jesus um, left heaven. That's what we celebrate at Christmas time. He left heaven and became flesh. He became a baby and grew up. So if you only come at Christmas and Easter, you're, you're really going to, you're like, we're going to put the bookends together for you. And so Jesus, who was the Son of God, came and his primary ministry to the world was to say, let me communicate and let me demonstrate who God is. If you want to know who God is, listen to what I have to say. Because what I communicate and what I demonstrate will actually fill you in on who God is. Without me, you're never going to have an understanding of who God the Father is. So... As he comes, I want to just pull you in to this incredible understanding that you will never get closer to the understanding of God without Jesus. You will never get closer to a real understanding of God without Jesus. 
So if you're in a place where you feel like you're moving away from Jesus, if you're, you're kind of just, you, you kind of camped out a little bit, you looked at him, but you're now moving away from Jesus, I'm going to tell you right now, then you're going to be moving away from an understanding of who God is. If, you've, if you stop, if you stop short of discovering who Jesus is, then you're going to stop short of discovering the Father's heart for you. So when Jesus tells a parable, taking an earthly reality to teach a heavenly meaning, it is vitally important that you understand when he communicates that, he's communicating everything that we need to know to give us the understanding about the Father's heart for us. So let's take a look in Luke chapter 15. Let, I'll read it and then I'll give you comment. And Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, father, give me the share of the property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all, all of his, um, gathered all, and he took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country. And he began to be in need. So he went and he hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who set him into the fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to, to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate. And no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself and he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? Here I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Just treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and he came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and he ran and he embraced and he kissed him. And he said, to his father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe. Put it on him. Put a ring on his hand, shoes on his feet, and bring the fatted calf. Kill it. Let us eat and celebrate. For this is my son. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is found. And they began to celebrate. Now the older son. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and he drew near to the house, he heard the music and the dancing. He called one of his servants and he asked what these things meant. He said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and he refused to go in. His father came out to him and entreated him, but he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed a fatted calf for him. And the father said to him, son, you were always with me. All that is mine is yours. It was fitting for us to celebrate and to be glad, for this your brother was dead, and he is alive. He was lost, and he is found. See, the father wants nothing more than the two sons, an older one and a younger one, to be sitting at his table and table represents way more than just a meal time. It re represents the power of relationship and enjoying each other at the deepest level of intimacy as only has been designed by God for a father to be shared with his children. 
He doesn't want them to be apart. So we take a look at the younger son, and the younger son, just a few comments on the younger son, and then we'll get to the older son. The first thing, the younger son is sitting at the table, and he looks at his father, and he goes, Father, I wish you were dead. That's not a good way to talk to your dad at the dinner table. I wish you were dead because I really would like, because I don't really want to wait around for my inheritance. So can I have it now? Yo, I don't care what, what age you're living in, what century you're living in. That's bold, that's audacious, and it is incredibly dishonoring and disrespectful. I wish you were, I, I can't even wait for you to die. So can we hurry it up and you just divide it up so I can get my share and get on? And so basically the younger son says, I want to leave the table, and he never asked to be excused. In fact, the way he leaves the table is one of the most disrespectful ways ever, and he turns his back on his father, and he grabs his share of the provision and says, you know what? Now I'm free to live my life pursuits. He journeyed away from the table. There are people in this room. And you know what that's like to journey away from the table. Some of you right now in this room are apart from the table of the Father. You're living your own life's pursuits. You're, you're, you, you've grabbed what God has given you with your gifts, your time, your your talent, your treasures, and you're just saying it's not about your agenda, it's not about your presence, it's not about me really desiring company with you, just give me what's mine so I can go live my life according to my plan. The second thing that we learn about the younger son is he ends up going into a far country and he sets his own table. He sets his own table. He goes, okay, this is what the table's really supposed to be like. It's party time. And so he gets a bunch of other prodigal partiers, and they all sit around the table, and life is good, and they're clinking their glasses, and they're cheering, and they're yelling, and they're having fun. They're jawling. And so, um, and so they're really going for it. Can I, I, I have the hardest time. Say it again. Jawling. Okay. They were jawling. I can't do it. They were partying. I can say that. But when, when the beer ran out, and the last joint was smoked, and the last powder was snorted, and all the fun ran out because the money ran out, all of his guests, who he thought were his friends, but were really only acquaintances, they left. You ever found yourself thinking that you've got the friends who really care and really have your concern, really have your back, but when things don't go well for you and the money runs out, so do they. And so ultimately, he gets into a place where he's in the far country, far away from the Father's table, and he begins to think, not only am I in want because there's a famine in the land and there's an economic downturn, um, he begins to think, how good was it? How good was it to be around that table, not just for the food and the provision, but how good was it to be in the Father's presence? Because when I was in the Father's presence, He really did love me. He really did care for me. He really did have concern. He had my back where these people didn't. And He feels the full weight of His choice and a series of choices that have led him and journeyed him away from the table into the far country. Listen, I'm telling you right now, 
There's not one of us in this room that has not made a series of wrong decisions and wrong choices. The question is, when will you get to that place? I don't know what that place is. It's different for every person. When you go, oh my gosh, this is what he came to. Rock bottom from him, for him was, not only am I starving to death for food, I'm starving to death for fellowship with my father. His sin was the sin of self-indulgence. I'm just going to indulge my appetites, set my table, and let my desires go wild with what I want. But it brought him not prosperity. It brought him desperation. That's what our choices do, apart from the table of the Father. So he turns and he comes to his senses and he does that kind of like, I'm going to go back and he formulates a plan. Isn't it great? This is how people do this. We all do this. We're like, when we start to make a move back to the father's table and remember the father represents God, when we start to go, okay, I'm out here. I've blown it. I've, I've made a lot of bad choices. I made a wrong wrong decisions one after another, and it has been such a downward cycle, and now I've hit rock bottom. Then we start to formulate a plan. Is it possible for me to go back to that table? And most of us, if not all of us, if we do take the step towards the table, the Father's table, we come up with our own plan and we formulate it and we formulate how we think God needs to receive us back. We, we write the script for God. We write the script for the Father. Okay, well, I know that he can't really receive because I've been so, I've blown it badly. And Jesus tells us he knows that he's blown it before heaven and before his Father on, on earth. Basically, he's saying, I've blown the two greatest commandments, to love God with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love my neighbor as myself, and my dad is my neighbor. So basically, I've blown the very two biggest commandments. So I can't go back. I can't go back to that table because I'm, I'm unworthy. I'm undeserving to go back to that table and sit as a son. I know, I'll go back, make my speech, tell him that I truly have sinned against heaven and, and my father, but don't accept me back as a son, accept me back as a hired servant. I'll sit in the servants' tables in the servants' quarters. Some of you who've journeyed from the table, who are in the far country living your pursuits, Pursuing your appetites and filling your desires. And the more you do it, the more empty you feel. So you just keep going. But at some point, there's an emptiness that will overwhelm you. And when that comes upon you, my question is this. What plan do you think you need to come up with to get back to that table? Because I'm telling you right now, Jesus says, forget your plan. Let me show you that you don't need to have a plan. You just need to come back to the table with a heart that says, I have stuffed it up, but I just long to be in your presence. Now look what Jesus says the Father does. The Father does this. The Father is... The, the, the grammar around this is he is pass, actively, passively waiting. He's actively waiting. 
He's actively waiting. So it's almost like he's not, he didn't chase after his son, but he's looking. He's constantly on the look. He is waiting over the, over the hills. He's, he's, he's waiting to see when will he come back. And it says, when he sees him at a distance, when he sees him journeying back to the table, the father does not wait on the porch with his arms folded going, all right, you little whippersnapper. You little smart aleck, spoiled, disrespectful little shaver. He doesn't even wait for him to get to the porch or the veranda. He runs. Do you get what Jesus is communicating, what he's demonstrating about the father's heart. The father says he, he saw him in a distance. Look at these verbs, saw. How did he see? He saw and he felt compassion. He didn't have disdain, he had compassion. When Jesus saw all these people coming to him, he said, he said, uh, Matthew tells us that he had compassion because they looked like they were sheep without a shepherd. When he sees you, he sees you with eyes of compassion, not disdain. But we think we, we have to formulate our plan because he's never going to accept us back as sons. So he felt compassion. He ran. In the first century, when Jesus would have said that, everybody in the crowd would have went. See, no elderly, wealthy landowner ever ran. They only walked. And oftentimes, they didn't walk too far because they made you walk to them. The God of this table gets up, leaves, and runs when he sees one lost sinner turning and coming back. <sighs> Happy Easter. And then he goes and says, it's party time. He goes, you think, you think, you know how to party? Let me show you how it's really done. You partied with prodigals. Now you're going to party in the presence of the Father. And I know how to do this. Bring a ring. Put it on his finger. Bring a robe. Put it around him. Put shoes on his feet. Kill the fatted calf. It is party time. I can't help but celebrate. He even interrupts the younger son's speech. Father, I have sinned against you heaven and against you. I'm not, and he doesn't even get past that. The father says, no, it's party time. For this was my son who was, who was lost and is now found. He was dead and he is alive again. It, we must celebrate. We must commemorate this moment and we must participate in it. That's what this table is all about. This table is about celebrate, commemorate, and participate with the father, not apart from the Father. So that's going on. That's incredible. There's the older brother. Now the older brother didn't go to the far country, but he sat at the far end of the table. You know the type, you just barely at the table. You're like, Glenn, dinner time. You're like, okay, whatever. Okay, I'm out of here. You come to the table, but you're only enjoying the provisions. I don't even know what these are. I know what this is and this is. This is stuff my wife eats. If there was biltong, I'd be all over it. But we're at the far end. The older brother is at the far end of the table. Enjoying the provision. But here's what we know. He's just as lost because he doesn't care for the company of his father. 
You know those people? You come and you take a seat in church, Christmas and Easter. By the way, we're so glad that you're here. If that's the only two times of the year you come, welcome. Christmas, Easter, put them together, you're a creaster. That's awesome. <laughs> but I want, I want you to hear what Jesus is saying. I don't want you to just take a seat twice a year or even once a week and just come in. Because, see, the older brother saw his father not as a real father that he could share intimacy and be connected with. He saw him as a boss. He saw his his father as a boss, just, and he was one who I just wanted to tick off the boxes and make sure I've done all the dutiful things that a son should do. It was almost like a business type association versus a father-son relationship. I think some of you treat God like that. You're like an older brother who you're if we really dissected your relationship, it wouldn't, it wouldn't communicate this incredible loving intimacy. It would just be more like a business association in which you come in, put your time, do some things. Every once in a while, give a little bit, do a little bit, and then get away from the table. But you never enjoy the company of the Father. See, the older brother was guilty of a different sin. His sin, the younger son, self-indulgence. It's all about me. Feed my appetites. Satisfy my desires. This one, he sat at the far end of the table in judgment. Self-righteous, his guilt, his sin was self-righteous resentment. He's just calculating every good, bad, and ugly thing. Not only uh, of what the, uh, the younger son has done, but what everybody else in his life is. He even calculates the father. So much so that when the son comes home and returns and the father throws the party and he comes and he hears that his father is literally throwing a party, he's like, how dare you throw a party for this disobedient, spoiled little brat? Self-righteous resentment. Judgment. You never threw me a party. I've worked day and night. I have ticked all the boxes. I have come to church. I have served on the teams and I have done all the things. But I'm still sitting at the far end of the table. And I am just as far in terms of spiritual distance to the father as my younger brother was. Proximity, closer. Distance in terms of heart, far away. See, what the older brother never really got and understood is he understood what God, he understood what his father was about, but he never understood who he was about. He knew what he had. He knew that he was a landowner. He knew things about his he he knew things about his father. But he didn't know who the father's heart was for him as well as him. So the father just like he ran to the son when he was a long way off hears about it, and he also goes, and he steps outside, and he says, son, he entreats him to come. There's a, there's a seat at the table. Come, you're missing this. This must be celebrated, commemorated, and participated, and I want you to be a part of it. And so the older brother says this, because he, he, he literally starts the blame finger. Man, when you pull the blame finger out, two holsters. He blames the brother for being a spoiled brat, squandering it. And then he even says, he's even, he's even spent your inheritance on prostitutes. How does he know? How does he know? 
did he visit him in the far country? No. You know how he, it could have been true, but it might not have been. How did he get there? Let me tell you, self-righteous resentment starts to spin. So that downward spiral is about desires, and it, it ends up in emptiness. This one starts to spin, and it spins in bitterness. And you start coming up with bitter scenarios. We don't even know if that was true. But he believed because of his self-righteous resentment, he started playing these bitter scenarios. You know, you're like, you're doing certain things and somebody's wronged you. And all of a sudden you start playing these scenarios in your mind, thinking of different ways that you could literally maybe take their knees out or do a couple other things to them. Or, you know, I mean, you're just thinking about what you could do. You're caught in a downward pattern and spiral of bitterness. So much so that his bitterness not only comes out towards the younger brother, it comes out towards the father. And you have even thrown a party. You never killed the fatted calf. You never even offered a young goat for me. He's keeping score. Self-righteous resentment keeps score, not only towards others, but even towards God. That's where some of you might be today. God, you've disappointed me and I'm keeping score. Well, praise God. Hallelujah. He doesn't keep score on us because my life would be one long list of disappointment to him. And he's saying, I got a seat at the table. So what is Jesus communicating to us about the sons as it relates to us. The earth, the reality is that this son was guilty of self-indulgence. This son was guilty of self-righteous resentment. But what is he saying about the sons as it relates to us? The heavenly meaning is, guess what? You're not one or the other, you're both, and so am I. We're both guilty of self-indulgence and self-righteous resentment. We're both sons. And that's what Jesus is trying to communicate. What Jesus is trying to communicate, even though we're guilty of being both sons, the Father is saying, there's still a place at my table for you if you come and you literally believe in the sacrifice. So Passover, we talked about the Passover lamb was sacrificed. In this meal, there was another sacrifice. And in fact, God is the lead actor. The two sons are the supporting actors. But Jesus, who's telling the story, actually inserts himself into the story. I don't think you ever watched it, did you? Maybe you did. Jesus is actually in the story. Where is he? Go kill the fatted calf. Jesus is the fatted calf. Do you know why you kept the fatted calf? You, killed the, you kept the fatted calf for special occasions to commemorate, to celebrate, and participate that you have fellowship. That that, but that, that calf has got to give up its life for the celebration and the commemoration and the participation to take place in the provision and the presence of the Father. Go kill the fatted calf. Our heavenly father has said, I have killed my son to make a way for you to have a seat at my table. And I don't want you just to acknowledge it from afar. I don't want you to formulate a plan. I want you to, to, to let go of your your bitterness and, and, and all of your keeping score ledgers and just come back to the table because we're guilty of both. Come back and enjoy, not just my provision, but me. The Father is saying, enjoy me because I absolutely enjoy you. So much so, I made a way to you get back to the table by killing my son who is represented as the fatted calf. And when one sinner returns, 
heaven throws a party. There are two other parables that happened and all, something was lost in all three of these parables. A lost sheep, a lost coin, and two lost sons. And when the owner or when the one who's in the relationship finds what was lost, they not only call their earthly friends and families to celebrate, every one of the parables, Jesus is communicating and demonstrating what happens in heaven. The heavens go crazy and the angels toss the roast beef up in the air because you came back to the table. Happy Easter. So we are coming to celebrate the Lord's table. So we move from Passover to the Father's to the Lord's table. And it's not enough. James and I were having a conversation this past week. It's not enough to just acknowledge in your head that Jesus died on a cross as the fatted calf or the Passover lamb for you. It's not enough to just simply say that he came out of the tomb on the third day alive, showing the scars in his hand and where they pierced him in his side. It's not enough to just intellectually acknowledge it. Jesus is saying, you must come, take, eat, and participate. Because you believe as we break bread together, as we break bread together, and you take and eat, you are eating by faith, and you are drinking by faith that my sacrifice has made a way for you to be forgiven so that you can tuck in with the Father. Let us stand and pray.